He is one of the most significant figures in German history, Otto von Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor. Honored and controversial, he has long been a legend. But just who was this man? What ideals did he follow? What made him strive for power? Otto von Bismarck, the first Chancellor of the German Reich. Two months after his coronation in Versailles, the Kaiser elevated Bismarck to the nobility and presented him with Sachsenwald near Hamburg. There, walking with his beloved dogs, he deliberated on all his important political decisions. The German Reich was still very new, and Bismarck vehemently responded to every perceived threat to German unity. His declared enemy was the Catholic Church and its Catholic Center Party. Bismarck's political opponent was Ludwig Windhorst, an eloquent Catholic who treated him to a verbal drubbing in Parliament. Bismarck rescinded the right to free religious practice and place the entire Catholic clergy under surveillance. The Kulturkampf, also the Auseinandersetzung with the political Catholicism, dient him as a bindemittel. The Kulturkampf, or the anti Catholic campaign, served to unify the Reich, which had naturally never known a true inner unity, since it wasn't the product of the will of the people, but of an association of princes within the Reich, which did have a constitutional basis. With the support of the Liberals, Bismarck sought to secure acceptance from at least the Protestant majority for his Reich, his creation, thus also managing to isolate the Catholic minority. But Bismarck overplayed his hand. At the next election, the bullied Catholic population voted in the Catholic Center Party, which became the strongest parliamentary faction. Bismarck had now lost the Kulturkampf, and with it the trust of many people in the country. The defeated Chancellor retired to his Pomeranian estate in Varzin. He spent seven full months of convalescence there. The failed Kulturkampf had not only undermined Bismarck's ego, his health had also suffered. Heinrich Struck, his doctor, warned, Your Highness is suffering from a functional breakdown of virtually all vital organs. My oil is all used up, Bismarck complained. I can't go on. This man had never relaxed. He had unbelievable sleeping problems and had been addicted to morphine for 15 years. Without morphine, he couldn't sleep at all. That was so during the two wars and turmoil of politics. He had countless illnesses. He had a fatty liver, asthma, gallstones, jaundice, gout, hemorrhoids, scarlet fever, varicose veins, knee problems, pulmonary embolism, gastritis, migraine, tinnitus, pleurisy, trigeminal neuralgia and constipation, which he suffered from chronically. When one looks at his portraits, the large one from Lehnbach, one sees a man holding himself rigidly erect, a man of enormous self-discipline. As if he's saying, I'm strong. I shall stand here and govern and fulfill my tasks, but do not try to see how I am from the inside. There, it is hell. Bad news from the Reichs Chancellery constantly forced Bismarck back to Berlin. 
After a long period of growth, the economy overheated and collapsed. On the stock exchange, the value of shares fell through the floor. Many speculators who had invested on the founding of the Reich went bankrupt. The middle classes were hit hardest of all. This debacle was part of one of the great cyclical economic developments that gripped both the European and the world's economies. From 1872 to 73, a recession began that lasted until the 1890s. It was one of those major economic development cycles that intensifies the problem, being a combination of economic collapse and the slump that led to it in the first place. After 1871, Bismarck's foreign policy took a defensive direction. He set about isolating France, which, as a defeated and beaten enemy, had no role to play in an alliance. Bismarck aimed for an alliance with Austria-Hungary and Russia. The Three Kaiser Treaty was signed by Kaiser Wilhelm I, Kaiser Franz Josef I, and Tsar Alexander II. With that, Otto von Bismarck attempted to drive France into the European shadows. Bismarck had his foreign policy Circumstances burdened Bismarck's foreign policy heavily, right from the start, since he had taken Alsace-Lorraine and turned France into a permanent enemy. All attempts at changing the combination of alliances, either with Russia, Austria, Italy or with England, would threaten the Reich if France were allied to any of the other powers. This had to be avoided. It just couldn't function. Peace in Bismarck's time depended on other factors and not on his diplomacy. Daily political life in Berlin didn't improve Bismarck's state of health, nor did it improve his temper. Every day he struggled with his chronic ailments. Bismarck firmly believed that he would not live much longer. His unsure constitution worsened when his closest ally, Albrecht Rohn, the minister for war, who was also seriously ill, resigned from all offices. The chancellor felt abandoned. Being in office will be lonelier for me, the lonelier the longer I stay. Old friends have died or have become enemies, and I am not making any new ones, he wrote to Rohn. Bad Kissingen, 1874. The Chancellor was here taking a cure. On the 13th of July, an incident occurred that would forever change his life. Eduard Kuhlmann, a fanatical Catholic and would-be assassin, had mingled with the celebrating crowds. The man was arrested on the spot. He intended to exact revenge for Bismarck's policy against the Catholic Church. Bismarck survived, but from now on he had a 24-hour police guard. Bismarck had been but slightly injured in the right hand, but it remained weak and without feeling. He found it difficult to write, and he was obliged to dictate even his personal correspondence. Following the attack, Bismarck always had a loaded pistol at hand. Outwardly, the one-time warmonger was no longer so bellicose. More and more, he had the appearance of a peaceable, if crafty, diplomat. Man muss schon sagen, I think one has to say that after 1871, Bismarck couldn't contemplate another serious war. 
There were some tactical tricks, but I think one has to accept that he considered Germany to have reached its limit and wanted to avoid a great European war at all costs. In the spring of 1875, the German press raised the alarm. An article appeared in the Berliner Post with the headline, Is there a war in sight? The background, the French army wanted to equip 144 battalions. The German army, above all Field Marshal von Moltke, pressed for a preventive war. Bismarck wanted no war at all, but banned the sale of horses to France. He also encouraged his staff to keep things simmering. The consequence was a war in sight crisis that lasted for many years. At this time, Bismarck found himself in a vicious circle from which, for all his iron will, he could not break out. His illnesses caused so much agony that he tried drowning them in alcohol. Every day he drank wine, beer and rum by the liter, deadening the pain with morphine until he became addicted to the drug. The weakness of his body and the burden of his office broke his will. Plagued by depression and the anticipation of death, Bismarck then took the most radical step imaginable for a man obsessed with power. He decided to resign from all his offices, as the Prussian Prime Minister, as Foreign Minister and as Chancellor of the German Reich. Bismarck actually tried handing in his resignation in the spring of 1875. After four years in office, he was burnt out. The Kaiser was dismayed and refused to let Bismarck go. Eventually, Bismarck gave in, strengthened in the belief that he was irreplaceable. His eldest son was brought in to ease the tired prince's burden. Herbert von Bismarck became heir apparent and did all he could to satisfy his father's high expectations. The son was close to the distrustful chancellor and bound himself as closely as he could to his father. In the loneliness of the Pomeranian forests, the chancellor recuperated from the business of politics. He went for long walks with his dog Sultan in the afternoons. When guests were entertained on his estate, Bismarck enjoyed turning the conversation to the dogs he loved above all else. My Sultan is out and about again, he said on one occasion, roaming around somewhere in the neighborhood, besotted with love. Doesn't come home, not one night in the last three. He's due another good beating. When a housemaid brought him the news that Sultan was dying, Bismarck was deeply distressed. Sultan. In his love for animals, the Iron Chancellor revealed his sensitive side a feature that didn't quite fit the image of a statesman. It seems a little odd to us Germans that a man like Bismarck could weep over the death of a dog. 
It somehow doesn't fit him. It was a sign of how deeply touched he was, only that. How much he had valued the loyalty of the dog, and, quite simply, how dreadfully sad it was. The death of the dog he loved hit Bismarck very hard. The loss cast him once more into a deep depression. For days, people on the estate spoke in whispers. He himself spoke not a word. Only his wife's piano playing in the evening raised his spirits slightly. Urgent government business drove the Chancellor back to Berlin. Under Bismarck's chairmanship, a peace conference on the situation in the Balkans took place in 1878. Participants in the Congress of Berlin were representatives of the European powers and Turkey. Together they sealed an end to the Russo-Turkish War, for which the Russians offered to relinquish their preeminence in the Balkans. As Germany had no interest in the region, Bismarck could successfully shine as an honest broker. It was one of the high points of his career. In domestic affairs, Bismarck made a change of policy. He disowned the National Liberal Party on whom he had so long depended. Instead, the Chancellor now made a pact with the Conservatives. The new enemies of the Reich, after the Catholics, were now the Social Democrats, who were bitterly opposed by Bismarck. An incident that would occur a short while later in Berlin, and which shocked the nation, would be of great convenience to the Chancellor. On the 2nd of June, 1878, the Kaiser went for a drive along Unterdain Linden, as he did every Sunday. A double-barreled shotgun fired at Wilhelm I seriously injured him in the head and shoulder. This was the second attack within a short time. That afternoon, as the news of the attempt on the Kaiser's life circulated in Friedrichsruhe, a trusted aide of the Chancellor gave him a full report on the incident. Bismarck's reaction was brusque. Was? What? Then we'll dissolve Parliament, was his explosive response. Then he informed himself of the actual sequence of events. A day later, as Bismarck made a short visit to the Kaiser's sickbed, he showed himself to be more sympathetic. Thoughts of the attempt made on his own life surfaced, and Bismarck lapsed into self-pity. The assassination attempt on the Kaiser woke Bismarck's fighting spirit. Enemies of the state had to be destroyed. The people presumed to be behind the attack were quickly established, the Social Democrats. At last, the Kaiser might be persuaded to back an unconditional and harsh campaign against these enemies of the Reich. The anti-socialist laws naming the Social Democrats were hastily passed. The new laws prohibited trade unions and other social democratic and communist associations. 
anyone who was merely suspected of having anything to do with them could be prosecuted by the state. At the same time, Bismarck recognized the explosive political danger in the misery and hardship of the working class and introduced medical health care and insurance. The Chancellor wanted to get the workers on his side. Bismarck had damit natürlich ein on the one hand, Bismarck pursued a very advanced social policy, but on the other, he had no particular aims in mind. In fact, his intentions were quite reactionary. He just wanted to keep the workers quiet. Once again, Bismarck left the nerve-fraying capital. Added to his many illnesses, he now developed a nervous condition that induced facial pain. It threatened, literally, to drive him crazy, and he was often forced to break off important dealings or put them in the hands of trusted subordinates. By taking a long break at his estate in Sachsenwald, he hoped to make the necessary recovery. Because of his successful foreign policy, the Chancellor was seen as a guarantor of peace in Europe. He was opposed to colonial or military incursions overseas. The aging statesman greatly feared endangering the Reich. But it was at this time his image was threatened by a scandal in the family. Herbert von Bismarck, his son and closest advisor, had an affair with Elisabeth Carolat Boyton. She was 10 years his senior, freshly separated from a leading aristocratic family and was a Catholic. Bismarck was furious. He firmly rejected Herbert's request. It cannot be, he roared, you will not marry her. You damage not only the family, but Prussia as well. If you marry her, I will kill myself. When his mother took sides with his father, Herbert responded to the pressure and cut the ties with his beloved. Peace and quiet returned to the Bismarck household. Privately and politically, Bismarck was on the winning side. But the old demons, his addiction to eating and drinking dominated his life. After a night of carousing, he would rise at 10 a.m. and begin the new day with wine and an immoderate breakfast. Roast potatoes and dumplings, knuckles of pork and roast goose. For Bismarck, that was absolutely normal. the statesman indulged in veritable orgies of eating. Bismarck ignored the warnings of his doctors. He just continued until his sick body tipped the scales at 142 kilograms. He just stuffed himself, filled up with everything that was available. One after the other, he gulped down desserts, meat, poultry, fish, all in an unending quantity. I also see him as someone who swallowed what he couldn't express, his great feeling for life. There was no room for that. That all was missed out. He had to bottle up all of that to be clear and precise in his policies. Only when he was eating could he let himself go and indulge himself. And the frequent cures he took brought no success. It was a young doctor, Ernst Schwenninger, who first managed to bring the Chancellor to his senses. He quickly recognized that his physically and emotionally run-down patient had great difficulty in being strict with himself. 
Schwenninger was constantly at hand, ready to raise a warning finger to the food-loving politician. His entire pattern of life was strictly monitored, and within 10 months, Bismarck actually lost 30 kilos. The Chancellor resumed his work in Berlin with a new flair. In foreign policy, Bismarck was becoming entrenched. In 1879, the Dual Alliance Treaty was completed with Austria, and which later Italy would join as the Triple Alliance. In addition, Bismarck forged a new Three Kaiser Treaty with Russia and Austria. And with that, the German Reich was as good as allied with every European power except for England and France. He tried to juggle with five balls, a great piece of acrobatic diplomacy, but it was simply all show, because the interests he wished to ferment were totally lacking. The necessary weight wasn't there, and he was juggling with balls that had no substance. That wasn't real diplomacy. In colonial policy, Bismarck surprisingly altered his course. Basically, he had seen no point in involving himself politically outside of Europe. But for purely strategic reasons, he now secured for the Reich islands in the Pacific and territory in Africa. Bismarck had never been a convinced colonialist. In 1884, his acquisition of colonies was motivated purely by domestic policy and tactical thinking. He thought it would be a popular move, which it was. There was a certain colonizing fever in Germany. He also thought that Germany's overpopulation could be settled there and distracted from social issues. Basically, he was a politician for whom the world meant Europe and not distant Africa or Asia or even the Bismarck Archipelago. Bismarck's calculations paid off. At the next elections, the colonial fever brought him the hope for success. Adroitly, Bismarck had created a distraction from the social and business problems afflicting the country. The German Reich had developed from an agricultural state to an industrial one. There was a movement from the land to the cities in the search for work. The Chancellor had not kept up with this rapid change. In foreign policy, Bismarck pulled off one more celebrated masterstroke. In 1885, he hindered a war between Russia and Austria. The price was high, the collapse of the Three Kaiser Treaty, with two of the states at odds with each other. On March the 9th, 1888, Kaiser Wilhelm I died. Together with Bismarck, he had governed Prussia and the German Reich for 26 years. His successor was Crown Prince Friedrich III. The new Kaiser suffered from cancer of the larynx and was already doomed to die early. His regency lasted a mere 99 days, then he too was dead. His son, Wilhelm II, was crowned. Next to the young Kaiser, full of strength and with a zest for life, the old Chancellor resembled an ancient monument. Two grueling years had begun for Bismarck. Bismarck really didn't know what to do. He was at his wit's end. None of his recipes worked. He didn't understand the nation or its problems anymore. Industrialization had expanded and social democracy had become more powerful. The towns were bigger and the land was vanishing. Landowners were going bankrupt, even though he'd given them all possible help. 
The young Kaiser came across as a man with social and liberal ideas, and it was clear that he wanted to see them turned into policy. Bismarck couldn't and wouldn't comply, because his policy was completely the opposite. Before he ascended the throne, Wilhelm II had clearly indicated that he wanted to take the reins in his own hands. Bismarck was furious, and his relations with the Kaiser were icy. Their political positions were too far apart. Wilhelm wanted to ease harsh social legislation, but the Chancellor refused. Bismarck held on to power at any price, even contemplating an agreement with his Catholic arch-enemy, Ludwig Windhorst. Bismarck's meeting with the Catholic was doomed. I have come from the political deathbed of a great man, said Windhorst. More and more, Bismarck lost power and influence, and even his supporters realized that sooner or later, they would have to decide between the Chancellor and the Kaiser. Bismarck was isolated. On the morning of the 14th of March, 1890, Bismarck requested an audience with Wilhelm. The Kaiser let Bismarck wait and put him off until the next day. The two were at odds over the struggle with the Social Democrats. The Kaiser would in no way support Bismarck's harsh course. As the Chancellor would not give way, Wilhelm suggested that he resign. Politics is fate, a Napoleonic conclusion that Bismarck could not escape, even in his worst hour. Unmoved by the pressures from the Kaiser, Bismarck spent two long days preparing his letter of resignation. He chose every single word with great care. The Chancellor desired a dignified departure. With this letter, Bismarck once again demonstrated his diplomatic skills. He was able to formulate his letter in such a way as to put the entire burden of his resignation on the Kaiser himself. When Wilhelm II discharged him, Bismarck was deeply hurt. But he never showed this injury. He was too smart for that. However, in the caricature dropping the pilot, there was something that England and other states had seen more clearly, and that was that the pilot had actually left the ship, and who was now left to steer her? That was something that people within Germany had not seen. At the end of March, just before his 75th birthday, Bismarck left Berlin. His departure at the station he described as first-class body disposal. But old Bismarck would not settle into quiet retirement. In Friedrichsruhe, he received journalists, gave interviews, and generally spread his political opinions around Berlin. Bismarck remained a constant presence in public life. Among the general public, Bismarck became a hero of German history. The Friedrichsruhe Palace became a center of pilgrimage. This was a secular place dedicated to saintly worship. The people had adored Bismarck. If I wanted to be mean, I'd say that this veneration of Bismarck was just a foretaste of the later raptures over Hitler. He was a man of power. He was the hero who had forged German unity. He was received with enthusiasm by everyone, by the students, the elderly, by the young, by the rich and poor alike. And he exploited his popularity, giving public speeches, unveiling public monuments, and receiving wreaths of honor. Bismarck was intent on actively forming his own image in history. He determined on writing his memoirs.
his secretary of many years standing, Lothar Bücher, an intelligent and educated man, was to assist him. Bücher proposed an objective, historical work. But Bismarck viewed his thoughts and memories as a unique chance to give his political dealings a greater perspective. Bismarck began to embroider the legend of his own life. Bismarck's memoirs are a work of pure self-justification. They're full of half-truths and lies. He leaves much out. He makes no mention of his fight against social democracy, his bitter campaign against the Catholics, the Kulturkampf, is blamed on his minister, Adelbert Falk. His depiction of the crisis over the Spanish succession in 1870 is demonstrably false in that he simply lies. And finally, the memoirs can clearly be seen as a campaign of revenge against Wilhelm II. In November 1894, Bismarck's wife, Johanna, died. With her death, Bismarck's life energy melted away. He didn't want to receive any more visitors. He was forlorn. In a letter to his sister, he wrote, What was left to me was Johanna, the daily question of her comfort, the gratitude with which I could look back on 48 years with her. Today, everything is bleak and empty. Bismarck's last years were very, very hard, particularly after Johanna's death. He wanted to die, but couldn't. He had no great tasks to perform, and he'd lost the bond with his soul sister. Johanna was the strength that had carried him, and when she had gone, life no longer made any sense to him. But he couldn't die while he still had so much energy. He couldn't let go. Bismarck's 80th birthday was celebrated with all honors. Once again, the grand parade suppressed feelings lingering from the great resignation. This was the last great performance of the man who unified the Reich with iron and blood. For some, the only great German statesman. For others, a political gambler who pioneered belief in a thousand-year Reich. There's barely a generation between the age of Bismarck and the age of Hitler. The best example of this is Hindenburg. He was at the Battle of Königgrätz in 1866. In 1871, in the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, he was a Prussian major and background extra. In 1914 and 15, he was in command at the Battle of Tannenberg, the great defensive battle in the East against the Russians. And he was the man who proclaimed Hitler Chancellor of Germany. This has a continuity which always alarms me. And in that sense, Bismarck was the demon of the Germans. He seduced them with his ideas on politics and politicians, and some Germans, even after the experience of Hitler, haven't yet been cured. In July 1898, Bismarck developed pneumonia and could no longer leave the house. He had a high temperature and breathing difficulties. The fatally ill Bismarck was nursed by his daughter, Marie. The news of his pending death spread quickly.
journalists rented rooms in the village inn. Among them were the Hamburg photographers Willi Wilkens and Max Priester. They wanted at all costs to be on the spot to shoot the picture of the century. So much so, they were prepared to invest 500 marks, money used to bribe Bismarck's servants. July the 30th, 1898. Bismarck's condition worsened by the hour. From time to time, he lost consciousness. But even when he was awake, he was no longer the same. Bismarck was in mortal agony. Later that night, Ernst Schwenninger, his personal physician, who had been summoned from Berlin, arrived in Friedrichsruhe. There was nothing more he could do for his patient. Just before 11 o'clock, Otto von Bismarck died. It's an irony of history that Bismarck, of all people, should have become the victim of sensation-hungry journalists at the hour of his death. The great statesman had skillfully used the media to create his own myth. And now the pack wanted their reward. Bismarck pictured on his deathbed an image to go around the world. Early in the morning, the domestic staff gave the waiting journalists the news. It was easy for them to get into the room where Bismarck lay, for those who had been bribed were conducting the vigil. They turned the clock back to the time of death. The first paparazzi picture in history. It was offered for sale in Berlin for 30,000 gold marks. But it all came to nothing. The photographers were arrested and sentenced to long jail terms. Then, under the exclusion of the general public, Otto von Bismarck was laid to rest alongside his wife in Friedrichsruhe.